Hello everyone. Um, I see a number of you coming in. So, uh, and I also see AJ mentioning that uh, Brian will be here. Uh, is Brian going to be in this chat? <laughs> okay, let me let me um, pull Desiree in. Yeah. Hi, Hello. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hi, Brian. Uh, I see Brian over there, and maybe later, when, when at the right time, maybe we can just have Brian join us for some questions too. Okay. Uh, so, welcome, everyone. We are going to continue our series of um, live chats with the teachers at DID and also alumni. Today, we have Desiree with us. Desiree is a, it's an alumni... Uh, she graduated two years ago, yeah, and I mm -hmm. think she's working quite a bit in design research now, and also being uh, being someone who doesn't just do design well, but also writes very well. Uh, she she fills her role quite well in design research and also communications. So uh, yeah, let's see, let's see, let's see as different ones of you. Some of you are alumni. Some of you are students who are intending to join DID as some of you are coming in now uh, and if you could raise some questions we can start to talk uh, anyway today is a Saturday so like the last time I did it on a Saturday I'm not in school and Desiree is also at home I, I believe right so yeah. uh, so being outside uh, for me being in, in my own uh, office in my own studio there, there are things that I can show you if you raise some questions uh, about things related to your work, uh, meaning that what happens to you after you graduate from DID, right? Uh, not to say that all DID graduates end up working in design agencies, right? But nonetheless, um, because we over here do a rather broad spectrum of work, I could give some, you shed some light on the different things that might be possible. Yeah? Okay, so... AJ, AJ, who is our host, uh, I'm not sure if AJ is here, but sometimes uh, she helps to bring or surface questions from the, from the viewers. Okay, so yeah, feel free to send in your questions. We have between, between half an hour to an hour, especially if you are a student candidate who intends to come to DID. Right? I'm pretty sure that in the last couple of days or a week, you would have seen some of our materials circulating around, especially videos about the, the course. And there are um, a large variety of things, right? Whether it is uh, works that are related to physical products, works that are related to digital interfaces, or even uh, works that deal with hospital spaces, for example. If there are questions on, on this, uh, please, yeah, feel free to raise uh, them. Well, you know, as the questions may, may take some time to come in, I can do a little bit of a walkabout first, if you like, right? So that, uh, yeah, <laughs> so that we can, so that we can, uh, oh, I see, actually, let's see, there's one question that came in. How do you generate ideas, right? I, I think this was a question that was asked to Brian yesterday also. How, does, how do designers generate ideas? And I watched Brian's uh, segment regarding that answer. Uh, Brian is another uh, professor at uh, DID in case you just join us for the first time. So uh, my, my own take to idea generation for designers or would-be designers uh, is to first start with the, um, like Brian said, you know, a, a certain momentum of generation so that you break yourself out of the confines of your habitual thinking, right? So creativity is always about, very often I would say, about um, being able to see and look and uh, intervene in places that others are not thinking about so much, 
right? Therefore, it makes you come across as uh, your idea comes across as either sharp, observant, novel, inventive, and therefore, for these characteristics to occur, the designer has to be looking at non common places, right? Or, or the designer has to be looking at with a level of um, detail that uh, is not commonly uh, looked at. And therefore, the generation process. Uh, actually, are you having some sound from us? I'm hearing a lot of It's okay to me. Uh, no, I'm just talking generally to everyone. Uh, Desiree, I don't know, maybe I should put you on mute first so that... Oh, okay. Or maybe you can like uh, cover your mic for a while. Uh, okay. Okay, let's try it. Anyway, let's put up a bit for now. Uh, back to the question, right? The generation process, therefore, is very important because it brings you progressively out of the box that, you, uh, that others may think of or the, the box of your own confines. I'm, being, I'm bringing this closer, sorry my face is very big, because I think it re reduces the feedback. So anyway, uh, yeah, so that, that generation process is key because when you gain a certain momentum to work on propositions that progressively uh, erode away all the options that you have in your habitual thinking, then you start to become, uh, you start to enter almost uh, by force right into a new space and therefore your creative work start to happen. Now, another thing that uh, I would add to this approach, right, is that uh, you could also, beyond just brute force, um, generate through uh, out of your own uh, habitual thinking, you could also try to use lenses to see the world where the lens itself is um, a fresher type of perspective than typical, um, innovators try to to use for example if you were to ask like a team of um, students designers engineers marketers or, or yeah to to try to generically improve a product or a situation right very often our minds will gravitate to things like oh how do we make it easier right more convenient less costly faster higher performance well so that's our usual gravitation, we would tend to gravitate towards such kind of thinking and, and it's not um, really an issue, so to speak, but uh, that's just the way I think um, our minds tend to be wired when we ask a generic question. And therefore, for designers, sometimes it's really helpful if you intentionally force yourself to look at other aspects of human beings or human life that makes people so interesting and complex, right? So for example, people actually, in most of their decisions, um, are driven by their relationship with others, meaning that um, from a social bond standpoint, the, the, that's a driver for uh, things that people like, meaning that if I use or do something or I am participating in a situation, one of the root things that uh, people are looking for is them being in relationship with others. That means to know someone and to be known, right? So therefore, or be in friendship. So therefore, if you use such kind of different lenses to look at your projects, uh, then you can ask yourself, um, how can, say, a uh, table be more social, right? Uh, be more promoting of the bonds of people. How can the playground not just be for exercise, but how does it increase you know, the relationship or the encounters of friendliness between, say, children and elderly, right, who are co-situated. And I, I raise this as an example because uh, one of my TC students, Mario, I think I see her actually on the chat, right, uh, is working on a project precisely uh, around that right now to try to intervene with playgrounds in the public so that maybe uh, by the designer's um, intervention or clever touches, allows the uh, children who are playing around the, in, the, in the space to, to have at least some eye contact or a smile with elderly who is sitting around over there. So when you see, see the world from the lenses that are actually more representative of how human beings really are instead of just easier, faster, simpler, you know, cheaper, right? Uh, then you get into new space, right? And there's so many other aspects about human beings that are interesting. And so, 
yeah, if the question is to answer how do you generate ideas, uh, I assume that how do you generate good ideas, right? Then, then um, one aspect is to start to be able to see human beings a bit more accurately, precisely, more interestingly than uh, how uh, the typical population would generally approach, say, let's fix a problem. Okay? Uh, I, I maybe let Desiree chime in on this. Uh, since Brian had under, answered his, his, uh, his uh, angle yesterday, and, and uh, I've reminded all of us somewhat of a bit of that, uh, let, let's let Desiree chime in on this, this, this question. The question is about ge how to generate ideas, is it? Yeah, how to generate ideas. Uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, I, I personally feel that I'm not as um, wide-ranging when I generate ideas. Uh, but because my my mind works best in frameworks, so having like strict kind of um, parameters help me to ideate. And um, I think that is um, a good kind of method to, to start ideating in the first place, to generate um, like more ideas before you can see about the good ones. So um, yeah, for me, it's to really set down like... Um, very clear parameters and so therefore ideate within, within them and then you kind of see um, where the ideas go and then you can tweak the parameters um, along the way. Yeah. Mm. That's a great point. Uh, and Desiree is bringing up things relating to brainstorming or ideation dynamics, right? Uh, and I would say at DID, one of the things that we train you on is how to do ideation systematically and well how to do brainstorms well. You know, they, sometimes brainstorms have a bit of a bad rap uh, where, you know, because everybody seems to gravitate to this word brainstorm and then uh, makes it compulsory in, in, at work, makes it compulsory in your school projects, you know, even in JC or in uh, IB or in uh, Poly, you know, you do like a school project, oh, let's do a brainstorm, right? And then oftentimes there are many awkward things that happen, like sit around and everyone is just, oh, I don't have a really good idea. I'm waiting for the idea to drop from the sky. Uh, some people would be talking a lot and a lot and a lot, and some people would be too shy to kind of interrupt, right? And then you have very weird dynamics. Well, therefore, brainstorms get their bad rap. But, but honestly, uh, they persist also, brainstorms persist also because there are people like, for example, us uh, at DID, who, or even as stuck as a practice, who uh, figure out how to do it uh, so that it's really productive. So there are ways, you know, and there are systems that you can put in place so that your brainstorms are actually really, really fruitful for everyone and also really fun, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Desiree brought up this point. Uh, ju just as we speak, you know, um, just to give you a sense of generation, right? Uh, and Brian kind of talking about generating. We are here. I mean, it's a bit hard to capture it in view, but um, okay, let me just flip the camera around. Okay. Yeah, you can see actually in our studio, for example, the process of generation is, is really plentiful and actually everyone loves to, to do um, yeah, <laughs> brainstorming. It's uh, almost like the highlight of, of, of processes, so much so that we have like a whole chunk of things here full of these boards, right? Uh, these are really, really big boards, but anyway, uh, it's part and parcel of the process. We are, uh, whether at DID or, as, uh, or in practice, we are highly generative. Uh, so to speak, right? Uh, and you will be learning how to do that in if you come to DID. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's enough for that walkabout. Uh, <laughs> let's see, uh, Brian. If you have anything to add, do you mind doing a wave? If you don't have anything to add, then uh, yeah, just let me know, right? Just let me know. Okay, I I'm going to move on to another question that is uh, raised by. Someone called cannot la, you know, right? So uh, I think this question is for, for Desiree, right? How useful is your time in DID when working in Stuck? So to put the question a bit into a broader context, the, it's a bit of asking how useful is your education for your work, not necessarily in Stuck, right? I would say just uh, in practice. Uh, tell us, Desiree. Um, okay, so in, in DID, I mean, I think one... Kind of very good thing was um, I I found that the kind of process that you get with your professors and your lecturers, um, it was quite um. There there was a lot of back and forth, and so therefore you could get a lot of um iterative feedback that you could kind of 
work on quite quickly. So, I mean, it, this means that the pace of um, working is quite fast, but it also means that you can kind of get to um, where you want to go in your project um, very quickly. And so, therefore, that translated into work as kind of being um, less afraid of trying new things and therefore then seeking, um, you know, critique and feedback um, without... Uh, being too afraid of of doing certain things, and um, another aspect also I found was that the exposure to the different types of projects. So um, when I came into DID, I really didn't really know um, kind of what I wanted to do, whether it was in design or whether you know I was even uh, suitable for design. But you know, having that um, variety of choice in DID because of the um, the studio platforms that you get to do. Um, therefore also helped me, um, you know, get a better sense of kind of what I was good at, what I was interested in, um, which then translated into what um, I felt that I could do better at work. Lah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, maybe I invite Brian to share something about the relevance of design education to um, work. I mean, which is, I think, one of the key things about um, maybe a key difference in in the way uh, university courses uh, compared to, to most courses, I think, would feel for students. Uh, you might feel very much that like between education and between uh, work, there is very little difference, right? So let me, let me put, can, how do I get Desiree out? <laughs> anyway, Desiree, let, me, let, me, let me turn you off for a while. Yeah. So then uh, I pull Brian in for chipping in. All right, let's have Brian chip in on it. Brian. Hi, Brian. John, I wanted to say you look great. <laughs> it's the lighting. It's the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> we make our studio lighting look like you know, in the studio all the time. So, well, it it um, I think the question was like the relevance or relationship between. Uh, design education and professional practice to a certain yep. degree, yes? Yep. Okay, so I think the most important thing in design education is indeed the studio experience. All right, so the studio experience is immersive, so our platforms are four hours in duration, and they're highly interactive. All right, so it's not a scenario where your instructor is going to stand behind a podium mm. and lecture to you for an hour, and then you read something, and then you go off, and you come back, and you have a test. You're actually doing a lot of hands-on activity, and that is precisely what happens in professional practice. So the studio education is a direct simulation to what happens uh, in the workplace. I would say the only difference is uh, the speed in which things occur. Mm. Right. So in in school we have we have time to iterate and make modifications, go through very immersive feedback sessions. In professional practice, those things happen also, but the pace is accelerated. And I would, from what I hear from former students, that's the kind of most abrupt transition to professional practice. But aside from that, it, it's all very familiar to them. Hmm. Well, I need to move back from this camera. <laughs> the, this this great point. The uh, indeed work is just much more intense. I would say. I mean, even for students who feel that like DID, honestly, would feel quite intensive already for most students, uh, as compared to other courses. But uh, I think when you go to professional practice, it just gets accelerated. But the format is very similar. Right? Yeah. That kind of. Um, studio discussion format, the uh, project collaboration format, it's diff completely different from how uh, maybe that transition you might face from a lecture-based situation to like uh, your work. Thanks for bringing that up, Brian. Is there anything else? Let me check if there are other questions, yeah? And... You, get a, yeah you, you, you get a lot nicer tools in professional practice too. The chairs <laughs> are nicer. Yeah. Well, let's see. All right, this is an interesting one uh, raised by AJ, who is, of course, one of our own, right? Um, and we could talk about this. I think it's uh, uh, because 
I think amongst the audience, there would be many students who are increasingly exposed to design thinking, right? Uh, even in the secondary school, JC level, uh, poly, um, since the government in Singapore has been trying to push very much for this uh, proliferation of design and design as a general enabling uh, thinking method or culture. Um, so therefore you see design thinking being spread somewhat also in schools. Now, uh, I would say maybe we have different opinions on it. Uh, maybe different opinions on different flavors of it. I would have Brian share first because, uh, yeah, I have some things against design thinking, but just, just slightly. <laughs> so, so anyway, let's okay. have Brian share first. Yeah. So, <laughs> thanks for putting one, putting one in the spot, but I'm ready to go. So years ago, when I was introduced to this notion of design thinking, I sort of processed what the presenter was saying, and then I said to myself, huh, design thinking is thinking, yeah. meaning it's, <laughs> it's a process that I had been using my entire career, but all of a sudden people in different domains started to see the value of it and then just kind of put this design prefix on it. But it's how I've always gone about the way I work. So mm -hmm. now let's talk about specifically what I think people are describing as design thinking. All right, so design, at least for me, design thinking is taking the sensibilities that designers and other creative professionals have always used and applying it to more complex problems that might transcend the specifics of a particular design outcome. So I would say a design outcome is design a chair, right? design a room, design an automobile, seat, design a mobile app, but more so design thinking as applied to business processes or systems analysis or service design. Um, but nonetheless, when I think about design thinking, it's about failing fast, it's about iterating, it's about creating concrete visualizations, uh, it's about soliciting feedback from your audience. And you have to keep in mind that many of our companion disciplines have never done that before. You know, my marketing might have never done that, or manufacturing may have never done that, or business that may have never done that. But now they're seeing more and more the value of we should make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. Or, or we should prototype before we actually deploy, instead of deploying and then it not working and then, then blaming somebody else. So. I think design thinking um, is, an important, is an important area, but it really has to be put into the hands of people that fully understand the process and not sort of commoditize it as, okay, here's a five-point bullet list that you all should do uh, and then move forward. I felt like I was rambling a little bit, but what do you think, Don? Do you have a counterpoint? No, I have no counterpoint that contradicts <laughs> what you say. Uh, I just add on to it because uh, I think I have a bit of the same kind of uh, gripe against this, this against this design thinking uh, kind of um, brand. Um, well, uh, there's something that's very good about it, right? Which is it somewhat popularizes the notion of uh, emp empathetic kind of thinking to people. Yeah. That means it, it tells us that every time we do something, let's think about the human being being in the center. There's something that's great about it. And it also emphasizes this almost a process-based systematic investigation. So I think those are great. Uh, Brian touched on failing fast and prototyping, which is also, again, part of what design thinking uh, tries to promote. Now, here's where the gripe happens for me, right? Uh, I think design thinking, because of its emphasis on process and understanding of people and research and knowing what the problem is, um, does not... Uh, really provide people who are uh, new to design with the tools to create the things to fail fast with. So therefore, yeah. Yeah, so the, the issue is that if when, when taken in combination by a general public uh, on who, who don't create ideas fast and who generate very quick possibilities to test, then actually there's nothing much to test because what you're testing very much is things that are based on very obvious uh, observations. And therefore, essentially, um, it's a bit like saying that when you go to 
uh, interview respondent to tell them, say, hey, what problems do you have? And, you know, they will tell you the things that you already know, right? And yet there are problems that exist that they experience, but they don't articulate because the minds of a regular user are not conditioned to see possibilities beyond the current. So therefore, design thinking sometimes becomes a trap, in my opinion, because it, it, it gives a false sense that one is able to be creative, um, but at the same time, uh, basically just enables people to find, using a very rigorous process, uh, rather obvious uh, problems, unless they are really good and uh, uh, naturally talented, say, with creating new possibilities to try out, or if they are very sharp and observant and sensitive and extrapolative in their thinking when they do interviews. So therefore, my, my main grab is that, um, but I think other than, other than the illusion that it gives uh, to create creativity, right? Uh, and uh, what I think it has done very, very well is that it tells people to take people seriously when they are doing uh, solutions. That's one. And second thing that it has done very well is it has allowed designers, innovators to have a common language to discuss this with um, the world, right? So um, for, for, one, for those of you who find that design thinking is actually interesting in your school work that you were exposed to it, it's um, at the ID, you will find that like you will be taken to the point of uh, what to do before design thinking, right? And then what to do after so that it completes the whole picture and enables you to be effective with it. Okay? So that's, that's my opinion on it. Uh, I, I have one I'm, more I'm thing curious to add, to... if you don't mind. Sorry? Yeah, sure. I have something I, have something I want, want to add, which, which I think is important. Uh, I've, I've had an opportunity to do design thinking workshops with, with and my position... Halfway through. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll try to go quick. I did some design thinking workshops with clients in the past. And the position that I've taken is to push them to be more empathetic to the process of design. All right, so they, they understand that designers go through a process that's iterative and fairly rigorous. Because at times they, they think, clients think they are paying for the noun meaning like the, the, the outcome, and this is what design is, and this is what they're paying for. But the reality is they're paying for the verb. They're, they're paying for the process that we actually go through, the research that we do, the interaction that we have with users, the prototyping that we, we build, the evaluations that we make, and the implementation. And so people sort of outside the design field don't necessarily have the capacity to bring those ideas into a concrete form. So with that, design thinking, I really kind of pushed them to think about, yes, you can contribute to ideation, you can, con you can be involved in interviewing um, your constituents, but then when it comes to like building now something concrete, that, that really needs to be placed in the hands of the designer. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask Desiree to chip in on this because uh, she operates quite a lot of design research projects, and I think that it's quite central to design thinking. Um, what's going on here? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So Desiree, I need you to like request a screen share. Uh, let me let me try to put in. Somehow it just doesn't work on my interface. But okay, Desiree, if you can see this, uh, please see if you could request a join in. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Desiree, can you share your, your opinion on design thinking yeah. and how you've understood it as a practitioner? Hello. Hey. So, so what, what should I chip in on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your opinion on this, this term called design thinking, you know, and how it really is like in practice uh, and what you... Um, do you sense any misconceptions that people have of it? And uh, maybe particularly for students who may enjoy this idea or, you know, on one hand, they might like this idea of design thinking that they may have experienced in school. On the other hand, uh, some of them might have dreaded it, right? Uh, so I think sometimes these things depends on how um, one really operates it or, under, or is taught about it. So maybe you could share your own experience with this. Okay. Um, 
I think similarly to what Brian mentioned, um, when I first kind of came to know about design thinking, I was like not blown away at all because like really to me it was like it's exactly the thinking that I I have already been like doing and it, it, it sounded very common sense um, to me, like the whole design thinking process. Um, but yeah, I mean, when it comes down to to actually doing kind of design research, design thinking, um, like that, that, there is some uh, parallels to what, um, you know, is stated in the framework, like of design thinking. And I, I, I do think that the iterative process is the part that um, really shows um, quite obviously in the process, like in, in actual um, design research work. Because, um, yeah, it, it's, it's just kind of down to, to really getting down to doing like prototypes after prototypes and not being afraid to, to you know, make changes and just do some quick and dirty um, iterations just to be able to get, um, you know, uh, valuable feedback and, and um, yeah, feedback from users. La. And, yeah, I, I think part of that whole design thinking aspect, to me, I, find, I found that the iterations and the iterative process to be, I guess, one of the more important parts to me la, yeah, in the process. Okay, great. And let's just see if there are questions coming up further. <laughs> Actually, we have a question from an alumni, right? Uh, I'm not sure if we know how to answer this question, but let's try it, right? What can I learn about designing for business in DIDD is asked by Narov, who is, um, who is, I think he graduated maybe six years ago or five, somewhere around there. Right, and Narov, I, if I'm not wrong, I think he's in DBS now. Is that right, Narov? If you can comment and reply. <laughs> Narov, if you're still here, um, and if you don't mind, why not I bring you on to share about this? Since you are, uh, and you can be in your singlet and everything is okay. Okay? <laughs> let me put Narov on to kind of talk about his question that he raised. Right, uh, let me put Desri down first. All right. Right. Yo. <laughs> just, just so you know, guys, uh, before Narov speaks anything, uh, the beauty about this is that it's completely impromptu and you will see actually um, how our graduates are able to just, you know, <laughs> talk about <Me>. design, <laughs> like design you know, uh, speak coherently. And he was re he's really in his singlet, you know. <laughs> I'm literally anyway. in my singlet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so great. Uh, okay. Narov is in DBS now as a design researcher. So yes. uh, tell us a bit more about your, 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 your whole journey and then like uh, why are you asking these questions so we can talk a bit about it together. Right? Okay, um, I guess the reason why I asked the question of, for context was because um, right now working in DBS, it's really a lot about how we think about how design affects businesses and working with a bottom line is very different when it comes to, you know, understanding or thinking about design. So... Um, just for context for everyone who's here, like I used to, um, I, I graduated in 2015 and I spent three years working in uh, NUS in a design incubation center. And it was fun. I had a lot of uh, room to experiment, play around with uh, new methodologies and uh, manufacturing methods with a lot of cool tools in DID, which we have uh, access to, which is great. Uh, 3D printing, CNC, really top-notch equipment. And... It was really fun, I think, being able to be let loose, like just free on the reins and just uh, do the things that you wanted to do. Uh, but when I went to DBS, it was a bit of a struggle because I think the pace picked up really quickly and I didn't really understand how to approach um, dealing with a business. So for me, it was a little bit of a switch in pace and also in thinking. So... Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight this question to, to Dawn, maybe just to get your thoughts on how maybe uh, what we're doing to maybe get people to understand a little bit about, you know, how we can kind of tinker or, you know, scale down the way we think in terms of innovation 
or not really scaling down, but more of sort of like uh, tempering our expectations when it comes to innovation in a design or uh, in a business space or in a context. Mm. So mm. let me chime in on that. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. Well, um, and cannot lie is asking me to answer it anyway. I see that he's asking me to answer it and not just get anyone else to answer it for me. Well, anyway, uh, let's start with a bit of a preface over here, right? Design, okay. it's a very broad-based um, type of field, yet very specialized and centered around human beings. Mm -hmm. That's for one. Um, and also centered around uh, certain change awareness. Designers know how change happens, how change occurs in the world, how innovations happen in the world. A certain curiosity mm -hmm. with the enabling uh, methods for bringing about new change and new results. Okay, so design is a discipline that's essentially like that. Now, it only really takes root and have its legs uh, to have impact when you bring it into certain domains like business, like um, even sometimes as simple as a type of product, whether is it a medical object or sometimes a type of service, like if you run a cafe, like some of our um, alumni have successfully done, right? You, mm -hmm. It takes root when you bring it into certain domains. So when you bring it into each domain, each domain will have its own constraints uh, that and ways of operation that you have to get familiar with. You can't go into it saying that I'm a designer, I'm the creative one, let me just change everything around here and expect mm -hmm. that things can shift as fast as uh, they, they uh, would be conceptually. So um, if one is truly a design thinker, right, or a designer who's centered around the understanding of people and people systems, then this knowledge around how change may happen or take a long time to happen or uh, how, what might ease this change would become central to your understanding as well. So in business, there would be a certain kind of constraint and a certain way to make things happen uh, in a product, in a cafe, in a kind of your own startup or in a app-based service, you have uh, different uh, yeah, parameters to deal with and things to learn. So designers would have the, if, if you want to be effective, you know, designers, have to be rather quick learners of new domains so that they can become effective. And uh, to add on to a point, you know, for me, uh, as an educator and also as an entrepreneur, meaning running my own uh, agency here at Start, uh, this fields of education or running a business are completely new to me as well, right? Uh, even though centrally yeah. I'm a designer, right? So yeah. how that uh, is applying is when we do business processes or we figure out a way to, to teach and train our employees to have this resilience towards uh, new learning, new technology, how do we design a system or program right, that truly enables them to uh, be motivated right, to, to learn on their own, to have self-directed learning? I mean, at start, we have this thing that is quite interesting. It's called the one-week uh, nano sabbatical. Right, which right. we, yeah, which which essentially um, allows every of our employee uh, two instances of a full week each time uh, within a year to learn whatever they want, salary, you know, that means they're paid still, right? Learn whatever they want that is of interest to them that they think will benefit their career, um, and then uh, uninterrupted. But the only caveat is this: after that one week, they have to present it and inspire everyone else in the team. Right. Nice. So, <laughs> so when you when you design a system like that, because as a designer you, you understand human behavior, you mm -hmm. the the part about sharing it is very important, because the moment that someone presents it, uh, in in that session, right, and if they're trying to outdo each other, I'm shit, sorry, I'm giving away all my secrets here. And <laughs> anyway, yeah, they're trying to outdo <laughs> each other. We, right. you know, every time you have this session, it gets better and better. Right? And then also, mm. suddenly you showcase people who put in their hearts to learn something new and you see, see whatever that they shared applied in their work results and suddenly they, they become super effective in a certain area. The others are motivated to learn more. So you cannot kind of like work your way to kind of force everyone to learn, but you could set up things in place. Right? If you understand how people dynamics work uh, as a designer, you can set things in place to cause the team to want to grow. 
right, by themselves. So, so we have this, and we have like um, very interesting uh, outcomes that come out from these people who suddenly become became like rendering geniuses over one week, and uh, people who became you know uh, illustration <laughs> uh, artists, or rather, they honed their skills so much just in a week uh, of uninterrupted time. So, very therefore, nice. I would say your design training at DID um, allows you to make change happen sensibly within uh, the constraints of the business or, you know, like how do you free up, like say a week of work, you know, and pay them still, for example. Uh, but yet, mm -hmm. you know what causes the solution to tick, right? That's, that's where I think uh, designing for any context, not just for business, uh, becomes helpful when with your training at DID. Uh, now, business has its own challenges. Uh, similarly, for us running a business, uh, we, we constantly are thinking, how do we do things in a more innovative way than the usual tried and tested practices, but we are not blind to it. So we usually check what is going on, right? Do, okay. do, we, want, do we have an angle that's more interesting? Do we have an angle that's more human-centered, right? Uh, that can get results uh, with half the effort or maybe in a more effortless way. That's how, yeah, I would say design uh, applies in this different context. Now, if I don't know if I answer your question, but... but uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed the piece. Thanks for sharing, Don. Right, cool. <laughs> Okay, uh, I saw that Brian wanted to chip in on this and he has a comment. Let's, let's bring him in. Uh, now I'm going to, sorry, kick you off. Okay, Brian. cheers. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks very much for doing this. Let's wait for Brian to come on. Great, Brian. Good to have you back again. I'll go quick. Um... So uh, the young man who's, who's working at DBS, you have to think about the context that you're in, right? because uh, innovation in reality scares people. They say that they're all about innovation, but as soon as you start talking about what's required to innovate, which of course is failing fast, uh, they get a little nervous. Um, so you have to think, you have to think like, okay, at DBS, how do I train my, uh, how do I train my collaborators? And so what I mean by that is how do you get them on board to feel more comfortable with what innovation really requires? Um, so the other thing that I would suggest is that you have to document your successes. Right? So you're not going to go into an environment where, we're going to do this project and we're going to apply design thinking and it's going to change the culture of the organization. That's not going to happen. What you would do is you talk about this is uh, how design got involved in this particular project. You document it. You look at its impact three and six months out. Then you have some regular intervals where you remind people of design's impact so you can take on more and more projects and then push to that level of innovation that I think that you're really um, aspiring to do there. That's my cut. Great, Brian. <laughs> yeah, anyway. See, Don, see at, Don, at Don's place, they get to take a lot of chances because that risk is actually invisible to their clients. They don't see the mess that you made in the corner. All right, but at DBS, they do. So then you have to be sort of yes, mindful <laughs> 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 and all this mess <laughs> but anyway anyway uh yes so with with our internal team uh we can take this kind of risk uh with clients we are constantly coaxing them to take new risks right uh that's something that uh, any one of you who is operating in design will always need to um bear in mind you are at you know essentially the nature of your discipline uh, puts you at the frontier of uh, discomfort, right? Where you're always on change and people don't really like change. So anyway, uh, to be effective, you always, you, if, you, if your clients are uncomfortable, if your friends around you are uncomfortable because you always have been a change agent and pushing for new things to happen and they're always like, oh, let's stick to the try and test it, right? Then maybe you are a really great fit for DID because we are looking for always people who want to push the envelope, right? The other thing is that... Um, you know, we, over time, being a truly human-centered practitioner, you don't just bash your way through with changes because you know that by bashing through and insisting and complaining about why the world is not 
willing to move creatively with you, right? You you don't move the needle, right? You essentially cause it to be worse. So therefore, um, by being really human centered and understanding people's systems, you you would after some time want to become a master at um, I'm not saying that we are, but it's an aspiration to move towards how do you coax change to happen and change acceptance. So therefore, at DBS or whether even designing a simple object for a client or even running a business and putting in innovation processes or creative uh, provisions for your team, you have to push against certain friction. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, Brian has put it in a way that uh, we have here almost like a sandbox, which we, which people don't see the risk uh, that we take. Um, but to be honest, even internally with a team of 20 plus designers to make things shift, right? Um, we still get uncomfortable, right? And uh, I'm the one who always rocks the boat. So anyway, uh, yeah. But uh, in some sense, maybe there is, uh, to put it candidly, sometimes I have a bit more uh, leeway to do that because I just say do it, you know, and then it's done. But but uh, I also have partners to answer to, right? Who who would have different perspectives, and we have to socialize the change. Okay. Okay. Let's let's see if there's another question that comes up, and uh, see who wants to. Oh, so many questions now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah. Huh? Uh, let me answer this question by Joe High Profile. How has the curriculum been changing over the years as the scope of design itself changed? Right. This is uh, a good question for us to answer because it, it reveals DID's uh, strength. Right. Uh, so thanks for asking this, Joe High Profile. I don't think you're one of us, right? So anyway, um, the way DID has structured its curriculum, I think it's one of the most interesting and special uh, courses in design throughout the world, uh, and also very special, of course, uh, as a type of course structure um, compared to any university, not just for design um, education, right? Uh, about six or seven years ago, um, our previous uh, head of the division, Dr. Yen, uh, put in place a system called the platforms, which, which essentially enables um, between 12 to 14 projects falling in broad category, categories to keep happening every semester and it allows the freedom of the the teachers and also the industry collaborators to change the content of what those 12 or 14 different classes would um, comprise. This essentially means that every 12 to 14 uh, or every semester you have 12 to 14, 14 uh, projects you can choose from uh, of which you choose two each time uh, that is super relevant to the current times you know uh, whether it is there's a crisis that happens like the COVID virus that happens and people want to kind of like uh, have a way to remind others not to touch their faces, you would see that it potentially becomes a topic in one of the uh, semesters that is coming up, right? Uh, of course, when you open up these 12 to 14 platforms uh, that are open projects to the industry and to every single different uh, faculty member here, which is one of any of the teachers, right? Uh, they too are looking for the most interesting trends to work on the newest uh, uh, topics to explore in. And so the course is constantly relevant. It's constantly updating itself uh, with such an agility that I think very few courses can match because every time, you know, to be honest, in, in, in having a curriculum uh, revamp for university is not a small task, right? It is something that you have to go through many layers of approvals, right? And to... And so I think to have this kind of like every semester is renewed and refreshed, uh, it's, it's um, quite, um, to me, quite a different thing that happens for DID. Uh, now, it's even more interesting when you realize that the students, they bid for these projects. So you can see that beyond just the supply side of meaning that whether it's the industry, people bringing their latest things here, all the teachers bring their latest curiosities into the, the place, the students are actually opting to go to the courses that they themselves think they are interested in or they think that they have, they have a good uh, career prospects in. So essentially the course is curating itself and, and self-adjusting throughout your four years for the best outcome that you want to personally have uh, when you finish your four years here. So uh, 
I, I remember in one of our um, kind of division videos uh, that we did like about eight years ago, um, there was a very succinct statement put by uh, uh, Patrick Cha, who is one of our uh, associate professors here. He just said that, um, you know, uh, DID, what he thinks of it is that we are always relevant, right? Uh, and interestingly, that was said eight years ago. And today, that is still the same. You know, after eight years, uh, every time the, the, the class is very new and very relevant, uh, I think that would be the, the key change to answer to Joe High Profile, right? Uh, that has happened for, say, DID 20 years ago and DID in the last decade, right? We have had a certain kind of a good success with this type of structure, all right? Uh, if anyone else wants to chip in on this, uh, just, just do me a certain, just, you know, throw it in the comments and I'll try to spot it. Uh, let's let's see if there are other questions right now. Okay, Joe High Profile is asking, yeah, basically what is the course like when it was back in my time? I was a student 17 years ago um, in DID myself. Uh, the course was uh, in its formative years and I think it was a lot more uh, uncertain with regards to uh, what should be taught by who or when. Um, but nonetheless, the teachers, many of them who are still there right now, um, they approached it with uh, their kind of mentoring heart. So I would say that I've got really, really good uh, coaching and mentoring by uh, Dr. Yen and by Christian, who is now the, our head. Dr. Yen is our formal head. So, you know, uh, the, when I was a student, uh, they were excellent mentors for my own projects, uh, even if the course was still finding its way at the time. Right, so now they are still around, and uh, you know it's just almost like the 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 kind of approach to teaching and the belief in uh, grooming students just got uh, supercharged by a better curriculum structure, right? And at the same time, we have uh, so much expanded the team of uh, of educators. Uh, we have practitioners. We have uh, people who have their own businesses. We have uh, people like Brian Stone who wins Apple Distinguished Educator Award, you know, uh, and uh, who is in fields that are slightly foreign to us, like motion design and uh, interaction design. So I think the course has come a really long way uh, to deliver on its um, relevance uh, type of difference that we bring. Yeah. So hopefully that answers your question, Joe High Profile. Right? Okay, let's see. I think we have time for a few more. Let's see. Um, and I, I believe there are some other students who, current students who are in this call, and maybe I will pick on them a little bit. Um, well, I have one question here which is not seeded by our own people, right? Uh, I think this is Ant Hawk, right? How do you deal with bad customer relations? Curious after seeing some designers' humor posts. I'm not sure what this is exactly asking, but bad customer relations, well, um, let's just say this, this may not be the most appropriate question for design students, uh, but well, as a designer at DID, you often, even as a student, right, you often uh, have customers because you, you start to do a lot of freelance projects. So maybe, maybe there's some relevance here. I, I think that... Uh, I'm not really the best person to answer this because I offend my customers also, right? But over the years, uh, over the decade of practicing, you learn better how to deal with people and especially, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's an issue that is uh, relating so much to design itself, but more about how do you see people. And to answer this better for designers, I would bring, and especially with, with Narov's question early on, right? I would say that Designers have a bit of a tendency, right? Uh, because we operate at the frontiers and we see change that is possible uh, and we also see resistance to change, uh, which irritates us. Uh, we have the tendency to think that um, we are uh, way ahead in our thinking compared to others and we have a tendency to think that we have the right answers. So um, to work really effectively as a designer, I think 
that kind of uh, perspective has to has to go away over um, as you as you mature because um, when you approach uh, your projects like that or you approach your customers or collaborators like that you will find that like it's impossible for you to tap on the best things in each discipline or each in each team member or the insights that clients would have uh, that will really help um, because you you have, you're seeing them with a certain kind of colored lens already right and and therefore um, you know being truly able to tap with curiosity into every different domain and discipline and contributor uh, you've you will be failing your task as a designer if you if you do not uh, uh, fundamentally try to respect what each discipline brings right and watch what each discipline or contributor uh, actual KPI is. So let me put it into perspective, right? Uh, if you do a project and your clients are engineers, so they're both engineers and marketers in this aspect because it's their own product and it's their business, but they are engineering trained, right? Uh, I think engineers have a good knack and responsibility for making things work well, work robustly, work at the good price, uh, and then um, maybe sometimes they would like to push and use the the latest in technology, right? With this kind of um, inclinations, you could harness it very well for projects if you put uh, the right, if, if it's activated at the right time and used for the right purpose. But, uh, you know, the designer plays the role of harmonizing all of these needs in the end for human being, right? Uh, so sometimes the designer might be harmonizing between, say, a marketing requirement and uh, engineering requirement, and they may be at conflict. You know, the, 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 the requirements might be at odds, meaning that you achieve one, the other gets compromised, and you, it's not an either or, you might need to find a balance point. So if you leave it to individual disciplines, right, uh, you would have each discipline pushing very much for one uh, skewed area, and it would have blind spots. So the designer's role would be to kind of find the best place to compose this competing tensions uh, and if a designer on the other hand does not play his role of uh, being the advocate for the human being but comes in and says that i am the most creative i have the best and innovative ideas and your engineering thing is just you know pursuing uh, optimization or your marketing is just pursuing sales you guys suck you know that's not going to be a good way for you to to create change to happen firstly you, are, you will have no team you will have no customers and then secondly i think um a designer's uh, limitation are real as well. You, you, you may be a good at um, understanding people and composing things together, but you are not that good at optimizing for things, right? And you're not that good at uh, making sure whatever your concept, uh, uh, however creative it may be, how does this get to awareness in the market or get to accept it, acceptance in the market? We are not that good at that. So I think, um, I know I've, answer this question in a bit of a roundabout manner for ad hoc, right? Uh, because essentially dealing with bad customer relations, uh, I, I hope the question is really about dealing with bad customer relations and not dealing with bad customers. Because, because the moment that we ask about dealing with bad customers, then I think we are actually setting things in a certain uh, wrong framework, okay? Uh, and I answer your question this way because uh, as much gloss or sugar coating we can do with our relationships with collaborators, project team members, or customers by saying things nicely, saying things in the most attractive manner, uh, nothing really you know lasts long unless the fundamental perspective of seeing how uh, each um, contributor or customer or discipline uh, has its value. Um, nothing shifts it like the fundamentals. All right. So hopefully that answers your question. Now, uh, this is a very direct question, and I would invite students to uh, existing students to just jump in, right? What is the time commitment like as a full time student? Uh, let me just ask Kian. I see Kian. I hopefully you are like uh, dressed appropriately. Yeah. Let me try to invite you in, right? Um, since you don't know that we're inviting me in. It's good for you to answer this question since you are a full-time student right now. Kian, are you coming up? If you can't come in because uh, 
yeah, if you can't come in because you're in the toilet or something, just uh, drop me a message. <laughs> right. Kian, are you are you there? Oh, Kian declined, so I think she can't come in. <laughs> right? Okay, let's let's pull up. Uh, anyone else who I see is a student. Uh, anyone wants to point at someone? Okay, let me let me scroll the list to see who are students. Oh, let's let's have let's have uh, Nigel. We have we got to pull you on, right? Uh, <laughs> Hopefully you can come on. I see Nigel in the call. Uh, somehow I can't invite him. I don't know why. Nigel, can you um, somewhat request request uh, to join the live chat? Nigel is not a current student. He graduated also a few years ago, but has very very practice. And as during his time in DID, I would say maybe he's one of the most hardworking students. So he can give you. And answer as to how the commitment is really like. Nigel, are you able to request a join live in uh, join in on the live call? I can't click on his name. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I have to wait for him to to click. I can't do anything about it. So in the meanwhile. I'll just try to um, talk about or answer any other questions at the same time. Yeah, sorry, I'm just having a bit of technical issues here. Uh, yeah, let's see. I, I, I... Maybe he's using some system where I can he can't dial in. But okay, anyway, uh, or maybe he's offline already. So uh, let's let's pull on. I see in the list, I see Sean, right? Sean is a current uh, student. Sean, if you are there, I can't click on him too. I'm not sure why. Okay, what's the current workload like? Um, to be. To put it in short, and we like to say this, um, it's intense, right? I say this because um, we are honestly not trying to bring students in who are not right for the course. Yeah, uh, I know sometimes we are at a conflict. To be honest, as uh, teachers who want to promote the course, we may be tending to tell people that like um, or tempted to tell people, hey, you know, it's not that bad. It's easy. But honestly, it isn't, right? So uh, don't be fooled if anyone tells you that. It is tough. It is um, as bad or nearly as bad as uh, I was heavy, right? Not bad, you know, as uh, architecture. So you've got to be prepared to uh, work hard. The, the thing is, uh, you'll find that at DID, maybe what, is, what I think is quite lovely is that uh, you, when you're working hard, uh, you find that you want to work hard. It's not because you have to pass the exam, you know, or it's not because you have to to kind of like study this enough to be able to to meet a certain assessment, right? Uh, you work hard because you want to do the best for your project and your project is showcased, it represents you. Uh, so therefore, uh, in DID and like I think in courses like architecture, because students are doing their own uh they're basically producing their own baby, right? Which is their own project. Uh, they tend to work extremely hard for it. And there sets in a culture of uh, a school where everyone is highly motivated, highly driven. It's a great environment to be in because even if you may be slightly um, wanting to take it easy, you might find that you gain some kind of, beyond your internal motivation, you gain some kind of external motivation too because everyone is just progressing fast. So uh, yeah, your, answer, your question on... Uh, Commitment like as a full-time student, uh, time commitment, uh, intense, okay? I, I can't give you a number of hours, but it's, 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 it's going to take up your, 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 your time a lot. All right. Uh, let's see. Mm, let's see if I can... I don't know if the people who were talking with us were, are still here. 
but let me see who I can click on and invite. Else, I mean, uh, we have kind of uh, come to one hour, right? I think we could call it a day if there are no other questions that comes in. Let me look at the questions. All right, anyway, uh, it's cool. If nobody needs to, if nobody wants to stop me, uh, okay, uh, yeah, maybe I see Direct Home Global asking this question. Uh, to set the context, the reason I'm asking is because I have young kids and a business on the side. Uh, I, I don't know if all of you can see that, that question and comment. Uh, I think it's so exciting when we see uh, a person uh, who runs a business, who has kids on the side, asking if uh, about potentially coming to a course like ours. Interestingly, DID uh, has been attracting quite some seasoned veterans in the industry. Uh, we have people who were running businesses uh, of their own uh, that is very stable now. Joining in even this year, in year one, we have, I think, someone who is around uh, either in his mid-40s or 50s, right? And we have a final year student now who uh, had been in very senior positions in his previous job. Uh, his final year now already, right? And he's about, I think, I think he's around 40 plus or 50, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, AJ just mentioned design journalist to Tim. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, the student, current year one student I'm referring to, who is, I think, in his 40s or 50s, uh, he ran a magazine business uh, previously, right? And uh, so anyway, to answer to Direct Home Global, right? Uh, sounds like you have some kind of online business uh, by the name of your profile. Um, I think there is a certain need to commit a good amount of time um, but if we were to look at how some of these students who have been seasoned veterans in their industry, uh, they come, they bring in a different kind of uh, level of proficiency with their, their um, with proficiency and professionalism with their experience. And so I think things that students struggle with, the typical students who are younger, things that they struggle with, I think these uh, seasoned veterans, they don't really struggle with that, right? And I think they're also very conditioned to the pace of uh, real work. Uh, so it may may be more efficiently managed than uh, how our students may may uh, experience it, but nonetheless, it's still it's still intense. Okay, not to sugarcoat it, right? Direct home global. I hope I answer your question. But uh, we've seen it being managed uh, well uh, in either case, and also, well, here's another thing, uh, because many people who are um, coming in, say, for example, after working 20, 30 years in the industry, uh, they come not really to learn in a course uh, so that they can, they don't come to kind of top the class, you know. Uh, they come because they really want to learn something new and enhance their skill set and uh, take something back which will enhance their business or um, pursue an interest that they had been pursued, had not had a chance to pursue in the past. So, when they come in with this kind of mindset, it's very much a learning mindset and it may not necessarily be uh, necessary to ace every class every time. Uh, it, so therefore, I, I think that uh, within the limitations of having family, uh, having businesses on the side or even full-time businesses, uh, you come in to take what you need, right? And, and most of, uh, uh, I would say, people who come in at this age, um, they... Or, or this level of experience, they're no longer so conscious about grades and how it looks like. And, and there's something beautiful about just being totally in pursuit of, say, a new field of knowledge or new kind of skill set. Yeah? So hopefully that allows some kind of balancing and managing of time and not having to perfect every assignment, perfect every uh, project. Okay? That's not an official answer. I'm just telling you based on what I see. Right? Uh, I don't think this is uh, official answer. Uh, uh, type of question uh, that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, looks like there may be no other further questions. Uh, we will call it a day in a minute. 
unless there's a last burning question. Okay. Hope you guys found this helpful. And uh, I don't know why we have a lot of uh, candidates joining, but we also have a lot of our own students and alumni joining. It's very interesting to see uh, who joins into these calls. But, um, oh, okay. I'll take this last question, Skull FB, right? Uh, other than product design, what other types of design are there? Well, design is in its fundamental definition, intending, okay? Like it's a bit of, I have designs on this, meaning that I'm intending something. It's defining it as I'm configuring something for a certain purpose. And when you operate in design, actually, whether you operate as product designer, industrial designer or what, you, there's this tendency for it to spread across all kinds of design, all kinds of fields. That's why suddenly you have things like design of business, design of interfaces, design of services, design of user experience, design of uh, apps, design, so many things, right? Uh, there are many design categories and I think they're constantly being invented over time because uh, Fundamentally, in configuring a solution for an intended purpose, you are not, unless I don't know for what reason, you are not limited to just one type of domain. In fact, most of the most interesting innovation today uh, occurs when you compose physical product design with like digital software together, or when you start to think of software in relation to a physical space, or when you start to think of how uh, physical objects in a physical space affects business, right? So I think we are facing a type of discipline where the discipline constantly grows in its variety and, and, and reach. So therefore, there are many types of design. Product design is really one type. And even that term is, uh, which essentially in the past was used to refer to a practice like industrial design where you design physical products, right? Nowadays, um, startups are, or even uh, software companies are using it as a term to describe a software product. Uh, so there are product designers in startups that are running software projects. And actually, when you talk to them, oh, they're referring to the fact that they are doing, uh, they are designing the actual product itself and not like working on, say, the promotion of it or the graphics. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, hopefully for Skull FB, right? Uh, who asked this question. Uh, yeah, there are many, many types of design. At, at the Division of Industrial Design, we teach an industrial design core which centers around understanding of people and learning things fast, being curious, right? And able to research well, uh, to integrate multiple disciplines for your projects. But essentially, the word industrial design may confuse people a little bit because we do a large variety of things from experimental materials to interfaces to interactions to motion design to communication design to um, teaching and design for education, design for services, design for apps, and design for products. All right. Hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, Direct Home and Global, I'm not super familiar with the deadline. I'm, I'm familiar with the JC applicant deadlines. The JC applicant deadlines are uh, is coming up in nineteenth of March, right? Uh, you can check on the Office of Admissions website, uh, NUS OAM. You can just do a search, uh, and you can see there are different categories of uh, applicants there and the different uh, deadline for submission of the application. All right. Okay. So I think that's all we have for today. Thank you very much for joining the call, and all the best if you are trying to apply for DID.